I'm deeply appreciative to these men for participating in the devotional part of this service. I want to reiterate what Dr. Sharp said a few moments ago to the continuing students, welcome back. And to the new students, welcome to Freed Harbor University. We're honored to have you on our campus. Today is the first day of classes, the first day of chapel. As I wish, as the administration, the faculty, staff, this semester will be a great semester for each of you, both socially, academically, and spiritually. Not only do we welcome you back, but I want to say personally to each of you on behalf of the Jones family, thank each of you for your prayers and all acts of kindness during Rhonda's illness and her death. She has been missed very deeply. Each day, I know a little bit about what Paul meant now in Philippians 1, that he had a great desire to stay here on earth to further the cause of Christ. But death was something that he was not afraid of. I have a desire to be here because of my boys, my grandchildren, but I look forward to death. And I hope to be able to see Rhonda again. The theme for chapel for this semester, as was recommended by the Student Government Association and approved by the chapel committee, is help. I'm struggling with my faith. Help. I'm struggling with my faith. It is a fact that every one of us will experience in this course, this Christian journey, that we're going to encounter maybe one or more challenges to our faith. The million dollar question for you and for myself this morning, am I ready? for my faith to be challenged? Am I ready for my faith to be shaken? Thanks in advance for the speakers that have already been contacted to and have agreed to speak and others will be contacted shortly to, be, to speak on topics that have been selected for this semester. I'm thankful to Caleb Sam because he'll be starting us off on these series of lessons on Monday. My objective in chapel today is to talk about the topic that I've assigned myself. The day my faith was shaken. The day my faith was shaken. I have four objectives. Number one is to remind you of a biblical reality that each one of you need to be aware of every day. Second, to share the experience in my life some 40 years ago when my faith was shaken. Third, to share with you my response when I encountered that event and then close with four suggestions on what you and I can continue to do to equip ourselves that when our faith is shaken, we can remain strong in this Christian journey. The biblical reality. If you have your copy of God's word, turn to Revelation chapter 12. In Revelation chapter 12, verses 7, 8, and 9, John tells us of a fact that occurred. So many years ago, there was a war that occurred in heaven between Michael and God's angels and that fallen angel that we call Satan and his followers. There was a war and Satan lost. 
And after the end of the war, Satan was cast down from heaven to the earth. And now he's reigning through his influence on this earth. And if you look at Revelation chapter 12 and verse 12, John gives us a warning, a reality. He tells us that Satan is angry. He's upset. He's mad. And he's angry at God for removing him from heaven. And now he's governed each day by mission. And that mission is to attack your faith in God. Satan doesn't want you to believe in God. And so Satan is going to do everything he can throughout your Christian journey to overthrow your faith. Satan knows his days are numbered. And so he's in hot pursuit. If you look at Romans, I mean Revelation chapter 12 and look at verse 13, the Bible tells us that he's in hot pursuit of the woman. The woman in the text is the church. Those who have put their trust in Jesus Christ, those who have obeyed the gospel, Satan is specifically after you. He wanted to stop the birth of Jesus Christ. He couldn't do that. So to get at God and at Jesus, he wants to destroy the church. And one way to do that is to attack your faith. To cause you to doubt and God and his son, the Holy Spirit, and the church. But I like verse 14. In verse 14, John tells us the comfort we have. For those in the church and who have put their faith in Jesus Christ, God has given you and myself two wings. Two wings that when our faith is under attack, we can soar to a place of peace and comfort. I am so thankful for those two wings because on November the 28th, when Rhonda died, if it had not been for those two wings, I wouldn't have made it through that day. But because of those two wings God has given us in the church, it doesn't matter what you encounter in this life, you can soar to a place of comfort. I, I encourage you to exercise your two wings. Learn to utilize your two wings. It is a biblical reality that one day, I don't know when, your faith is going to be challenged. Your faith is going to be tested. Are you able to use your two wings? Your faith is going to be tested. Now, the event that shook my faith. 1973, I looked at the city of Tupelo, Mississippi, and saw some things as a teenager that I didn't like. And so I made the decision that I wanted to be a gospel preacher in 1973. And after making that acknowledgement that I wanted to be a gospel preacher, the first person that I wanted to convert was my oldest brother, Billy. Billy was not a member of the church. Billy was a small time drug user. And as we said back in the 70s, drug pusher. And so I went to work on Billy. And after about a year, Billy stopped using drugs and he stopped selling drugs. In 1974, he started going to church with me. And I was so elated. And he and I had numerous Bible studies. And on a Wednesday night in August of 1974, Billy leaned over to me and said, Sammy, on Sunday morning, I want you to baptize me into Christ. I was so elated. 
I was going to baptize my brother into Christ, a person that I loved dearly. On Friday night, Billy went to the community center there in Tupelo to play basketball. Billy was 6'6", and he played a little tough. And he caught an elbow to the head, but he kept playing. I noticed a gash, but that was Billy. He was a tough, tough man. Later on that day, I dropped him off at his home with his wife that was expecting their second child and a two-year-old daughter. Little did I know what was about to occur. Around 2 a.m., the phone rang at my parents' home. And Billy's wife said that she couldn't wake Billy up. An ambulance was called, and they rushed Billy to the hospital. About four, I couldn't sleep. I got up and I went to the hospital and at 6.30 a.m. After an examination, the doctor told us that Billy had formed a blood clot and they cut off oxygen to his brain. At 6.30, he was pronounced brain dead. Three days later, he died from pneumonia. It was a Saturday morning when he was pronounced brain dead. I didn't get to baptize my brother. And that's all I could think about, that he had not obeyed the gospel. My response, I blame God. God is not a loving God. He's not a fair God. Because he knew my brother was going to be baptized the next day, why would God allow a freak accident like this to take him? If God was a loving God and God loved me, why wouldn't he let me baptize my brother? There's no way I'm going to believe in this God. There's no way I ever step foot in another church. I'm not going to preach him. I'm not going to believe in him. Matter of fact, I hate you, God, is the emotion that I felt. Even though it's been over 40 years, every day I wished that I had baptized my brother that night. But we thought we had until Sunday. We thought we had until Sunday. Now my brother's in God's hand, and it's taken me a, a while to get to this point in my life. I don't know if I will ever see my brother again. But I know whatever the results, God will comfort me. But if I had to do it all over again, I would have baptized Billy that I would have impressed upon him that night the urgency. I pause to say this to you. If you have family members and relatives and friends that you love, I plead with you to impress upon them the urgency of obeying the gospel. Don't let them think they have until tomorrow. Don't you think you have unto the morrow. Don't let them die without Jesus. Now, I suggest to you in closing four things to consider in equipping yourself that when your faith is shaken, what can you do to remain strong? You see, my response on November the 28th was significantly different than in August 
1974 because I was ready. I was ready this time. The first thing I suggest to you is what David Day read to us in Psalm 73. I meant for him also to read verse 2, and I didn't state that. And that is to stay ready. The psalmist's faith was shaken. He says that Sammy, paraphrasing it, my feet almost slipped, Sammy. I almost slipped. If you are not ready, if you do not prepare yourself for the unexpected, you may quit and not come back. I'm thankful to my grandmother for helping me to come back. I'm thankful for Christian friends who came to me even though I didn't go to church for six months of my life or believe in God that encouraged me to come back and I did. Be ready for the unexpected. It can occur at any time. Number two, in 2 Chronicles chapter 20 and verse number 12, or verse 9, King Jehoshaphat in this text was about to be attacked by multiple nations, his relatives. He knew the chances of him winning this war was impossible. They were outnumbered. But the king did something that I challenge you to do when your faith is tested. He called the people together and he led them in a prayer. Learn to lean on the Lord when the unexpected occurs. Learn to lean on God when the unexpected occurs. And it's going to occur. I don't know when, but the day is coming. It could be this year. It could be next year. But something is going to occur in your life that's going to shake you and your faith. Be ready. But the king says, paraphrasing, I don't know what to do. My back's against the wall, but God, my eyes are on you. Learn to lean on the Lord. Number three, 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 13, as Wayne read to us, know this, God is faithful, and God will not allow Satan to test you beyond what your ability is able. God knows how much you can bear. I didn't think I could handle the death of my brother. But I was ready. And on April the 25th, 2014, when that doctor told Rhonda, told us, that you have triple negative breast cancer and you only have three months to live. We looked at each other and we said, why not? Why not us? We've been in the church 40 years and if our faith can't sustain us in this time, then we've been living a lie. We were ready because we believe in a God who is faithful. She lived seven months. And I'm so thankful to God that we had those seven months together. But she was ready. And we used those wings quite often over those seven months to go to a place of peace and I'm using them now. And number four, Daniel 3.17, you'll know the story well. The three Hebrew boys tell us to remember that we serve a God who is able. There are others like Brother Brown and others who have lost a spouse and lost loved ones and you've lost loved ones. And when you lose someone that's dear to you, that you love, you don't know how you're going to make it. But we serve a God who is able to help us along the way. I stand before you today by the grace of God. 
Because if it hadn't been for God's power helping me, I wouldn't be here today. Your faith is going to be shaken. And may the presentation this week in chapel of this year help you to remain faithful to God. Consider yourself dismissed.